Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Sparks 18. We are joined by our panel for today. As you'll notice, there are some new faces. Um, hopefully, we are not new faces, but if we are, <laughs> I am Julie Hecht, um, and this is Mia Cobb, um, and we are your science hosts for the conference. We are. So we'll just briefly introduce um, our speakers, some we've heard from today, some you'll be getting to know over the next two days. Um, so to begin with, we've got Dr. Adam McCloisey of the Family Dog Project in Hungary. And we also have Dr. Claire Wade, who's a professor of animal genetics at the University of Sydney in Australia and chair of computational biology and animal genetics. And we have Dr. Chris Zari, who is the director of Applied Genomics Center at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Western University of Health Sciences. And to his left, we have Dr. Jessica Heckman, who's a postdoctoral associate at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And to her left, we have Dr. Kelly Ballantyne, who is a veterinary behaviorist and a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. So we get to essentially discuss today's topic, but with some inputs from voices that you'll hear more from um, on the next two days. So to begin with, we have kind of a, a question that resonated with both of us um, as people who have lived with dogs and do live with dogs. Um, and this is actually from Luna the Labradoodle. Um, and she is anxious. She ha is, has separation anxiety. Um, and she can be timid around loud noises. And they were wondering if her, her person um, was wondering if that can be a genetic trait. Um, and can it be trained out? So this feeling, and also the last question, am I a bad mom? So people have a lot of anxiety and feelings around the feelings of the dogs that they live with. What do you all think? <laughs> so I'll start first. And to Luna's mom, I would say, no, you are not a bad dog mom. Um, as my work as a veterinary behaviorist, I see uh, people and their pets all the time and pets with separation anxiety. And um, what I see is that people are doing the best that they can mm -hmm. and they really love their dogs. Mm -hmm. So just because your dog has separation anxiety does not mean that you're a bad dog mom. Yeah. So what I'm really interested in in my research is what makes up a dog personality, how much of it is environment and how much of it is genetics, and of course it's both things. Um, so in the case of a dog with separation anxiety, when you ask if it's genetic, I'd say it's not that there is a switch that genetics through to pre-program your dog to have separation anxiety. I'd say that your dog certainly has some measure of genetic risk of developing separation anxiety, and then something happened, and that absolutely does not mean that it was your fault or that you did anything wrong. Um, on Sunday, I'll be going into with uh, a lot of detail of the various <laughs> things that help make up the developing dog personality that can influence them to go one way or another in interaction with their genetics. Um, so. Genetics probably had some role to play, probably not the whole role, but that absolutely doesn't mean that you should beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the question as well was, can, there, can separation anxiety be mm -hmm. fixed? And I am not sure that Kelly took a moment to answer <laughs> that, not. but I'm going <laughs> to insist that she does. <laughs> OK, so in terms of can you train separation anxiety out of a dog, I would answer that as no, because I don't really feel that true separation anxiety is a training problem. It is usually a problem seated in the dog's underlying emotions, such as fear and anxiety. And that's not something that is um, amenable to obedience training. Now, there's behavior modification that can be done that can improve separation anxiety. Um, the way that you manage the dog can improve separation anxiety. And depending on the severity of the dog's um, level of fear and anxiety, there are also medications that can help dogs with separation anxiety. So there are a lot of things that you can do to help these dogs, but I wouldn't say that this is a, an obedience problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So don't give up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. May, may I just add here something that because people who are living dog, for them, having a dog around is a thought, especially in, in a flat, is a normal thing. However, being in a close environment is totally not normal for an animal. So I think in many in our cases, when we expect a dog to perform in any other way, we don't really take into account that how natural the situation is. Dog is an animal that likes to be in control of the situation, want to, has to observe what's going on. And now if the dogs are living in a small flat or even 
in a larger house, they are alone, they are not able to control a lot of things when there's a thunder outside or when there, there's a car coming. So I think this very much contributes to the development of this behavior which also actually some people have separation anxiety, so <laughs> why is it a surprise mm -hmm. <laughs> that dogs developed it also? Mm -hmm. So one, one other just quick point to bring up on what you said, Kelly, um, the, that the public at home, this difference between obedience mm -hmm. and behavior modification. Could you just briefly touch on that? Sure. Um, so the way that I think about the difference between obedience and behavior modification is obedience is when we're teaching a dog uh, maybe like a physical skill such as sit. Um, whereas behavior modification, not only are we trying to change the animal's actual behavior, we also focus a lot on changing their emotional state at the same time. So um, I, we might be using different criteria for what we're expecting or what kind of behaviors we're rewarding and um, we're not looking for like a downstay, let's say. We're just looking for the dog to be comfortable and, and also looking at their body language to tell us, are they feeling more comfortable in this situation or do they look scared and mm -hmm. how do we modify the training situation to adjust for that? Yeah. I'm going to bring it back over to Adam, if that's okay. We had some um, questions that came up after your talk and question session. So what I might do is start with you and then open it up to the broader panel. Um, and that was, what other factors do you feel influence agonistic behavior tendencies? And I guess we're talking about environmental factors, like perhaps a dog has come from a puppy mill. Um, we're looking at individual factors, so whether perhaps the dog has been spayed or neutered or not. And also um, factors that relate specifically to the animal. So perhaps if they've got an owner that's had previous dogs before versus one that's living with a dog for the first time. Have you seen any relationship between those things and the agonistic behavioral tendencies. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a question that always comes up and we can don't get, can get a clear answer because um, aggression is a, a very hot topic, but, but studies are not there and it's very difficult to have a clear answer. There are, it's a multifactorial situation. So what I would say is rather is this, yes, first of all, aggressive behavior as a, from an etiological point of view is a natural behavior. So it's nothing bad if a dog is attacking the postman uh, in general uh, because it's protecting something or it thinks that he can protect something. So this is part of the normal dog behavior. Obviously, as we in humans and also among dogs, there's, we try to encourage not to do that because there are other means of, of interacting with the other dog or the other human. So I think, um, what my message is rather talking, rather talking about factors is that the good thing in comparison, especially in comparison to the wolf, is that aggressive behavior is, is very much, um, a, there's a very much a possibility that you can modify the aggressive behavior. One way of modification is that to show, socialize the dog. So you get the dog the means to express itself uh, with the other people, with other dogs, and therefore, the, in, in most of the cases, actually, if you consider how many dogs are living with humans and compare to that frequency, how little uh, interactions are considered as really negative or, or have a bad outcome, I think we really manage a very, or we do a good job, and the dogs are also doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So I think this is what you have to consider, and I think most of the aggression behavior could be put under control if you are socializing the puppy, if you are allowing the puppy to get experience and interact in a, in a direct way with other dogs and with other humans. So a bit to that point, um, is there a way, and this is a general question, um, to use the information on genetics when trying to help under-socialized dogs or dogs that haven't had experience with people? Is there? What, you, yeah. what, what I, I would say that the studies aren't there yet mm -hmm. to, to give us the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I think um, maybe in a few years' time we might have a little bit more information, but as we've already seen today, the, the body of works just not there yet to give us confidence to answer that question. And I guess, is there any risk when we've got self-reported owner behaviours too and they're being categorised into breeds? Um, is there a risk that we're actually getting some misinformation into the picture? Well, I mean, if we go into the direction of the breeds, obviously the, the selection of breeds also um, um, affected the tendency for showing aggressive behavior. So, for example, breeds that are used for protecting a territory uh, many, many years ago, and now they are finding themselves in a flat or in a small garden, they are still protecting the territory. But 
Now this is not, this is not an advantageous behavior. So how to get rid of it uh, in general terms? I mean, obviously there could be a selection against this trait, mm -hmm. but the problem is, First of all, the, the methods are not there. It's quite difficult to select against territorial behavior in a Caucasian dog, for example. How do you do it? And you need a very consistent uh, breeding protocol. It's possible, I think, at least from the genetic point of view, in my opinion, but nobody really seems to be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, the development of genetic diagnostics to aid in the identification of um, undesirable traits, and I say undesirable in quotes because that's the general term I use. It it's, doesn't mean it's good or bad. It just means for your for your application, you don't want it. Um, when I was a postdoc in the Neuropsychiatric Institute, um, I worked on uh, trying to predict efficacy to fluoxetine, which is a treatment that's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor that's used for separation anxiety, and we identified. Um, some allelic variants in corticotropin releasing hormone receptor one that predicted efficacy. And so these were um, associated with uh, increased uh, anxiety scores on the HAMD uh, psychological eva evaluation in humans. So because of comparative genomics, I wouldn't be surprised if there were comparable markers in dogs. But like you said, I don't think we're there yet. I guess um, I also wanted to follow up on what Adam was saying about um, breeding and to make the point that um, we are, we do have a very well organized and very effective breeding program in um, cattle. And we have managed in that species to do a really impressive job of selecting for, uh, again, a complex trait which is somewhat difficult to select for, similar to behavior, which is the amount of milk production um, and other related traits like foot health. Um, and over the last some number of decades, the phenotypes that we see in dairy cattle have changed dramatically as a result of this breeding. Um, and we haven't been doing that in dogs. It would require the dog breeding community to really come together um, to put a lot of the information about dog uh, behavior and health in some central place uh, for analysis and then reference that in making their breeding decisions. And that culture really isn't there with dog breeders right now. But I feel strongly that if we really want to start changing the way that we breed dogs in the future and moving towards healthier dogs, um, improving things like hip dysplasia and cancer incidence, and start um, having behaviorally uh, uh, more res genetically resilient dogs, that that's something that we're going to have to start thinking about going forward. One last thing. Um, there's a few papers out there that show that there's decreased incidence of undesirable anatomical traits in dogs with some of the plans you're talking about, but they're very limited. So I mean, that approach is definitely efficacious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd just like to say that I think a lot of breeders do actually take temperament into consideration in their breeding programs. I think it's a falsehood that all they concentrate on is the physical appearance of the animal. I think most of the breeders that I know are very, very keen to select animals that have good temperaments. We've actually had a question along those lines. But do you want to say some more, Adam, no, no, before no. I go to that? No, no. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the questions that came through on Twitter was asking when dogs are bred for the show ring, and when, particularly when the emphasis on um, a specific physical trait within the breed standard, such as a, ro a rare coat colour or uh, an extreme morphology, how does that impact on their behavioural genetics? So, uh, you know, an example I've heard, um, be it a myth or be it just, you know, um, rumours, but I've, you know, I've heard people say on the streets um, that something like a chocolate Labrador um, has a bit of a fallout in behaviour for having been selected for that coat colour. Um, do you think that's a fair observation um, in your experiences? I think Claire has something she'd like to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just came here from a house that has a chocolate Labrador who's absolutely adorable, mm -hmm. so I, I don't think that you can generalise in that way. Although I will say that in mouse genetics, the gene for brown coat colour in dogs does actually lie near a region that in mouse genetics was once associated with aggressive behaviour in mice. So it may be that it's close to a gene that has an effect on behaviour and maybe there are some lines of, of dogs of a particular type that might have inherited that version of the gene that creates that bad behaviour, but I don't think that you can... I don't think it's the brown coat colour itself that makes the difference. It might be things nearby that mm. there might be certain lines that that does appear to follow in. And that's just one example. I guess just wherever there's an emphasis on a physical trait, it's realistic to expect there's going to be some impact on behaviour, isn't it? 
I was just going to say two things quickly. One is that um, from an embryological point of view, uh, ectoderm gives rise to brain and pigmentation. And um, some of the enzymes that are involved in converting some of the pigments are, um, have, are in the brain and do do things. And then the second thing I would say is that imagine there are a group of people that had poorly behaved chocolate labs because they failed in their training and that this this group of labs became kind of notorious, if you will. Then if other chocolate labs misbehaved with the same frequency as other labs, people would just kind of say, oh yeah, chocolate labs are known for that. So it's very easy to get generalizations mm. that aren't really based in science. Mm. So the answer is it's complicated and I don't mm. know. <laughs> Thank you. Those are all the answers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people, what people often mix is the, the fact that what, what Oclair was uh, uh, going at is the, the, find that the fact that we find association, what we call association. So two things go together, and whether there is a causal relationship, so whether that gene is actually causing something. Now, there is the same for, for Dalma, Dalmatian dog, for example, that coat color is, is in association with the chance that the dog would actually have um, hearing problems or not, but it might not be that the same gene is actually causing the hearing problem that causes the, the code change. So, so we have to be careful and I think these are, we are still not there. So I mean for that we would need probably very precise genetic studies in order to say that something is causing uh, another Are we, are we not going to talk about domestication syndrome at all? Nobody? Are you okay if you want? So for those who don't know about it, it's this hypothesis that um, that as animals became domesticated, we started seeing a lot of very similar changes, not just in their behavior, but in their morphology. And so we start seeing more domesticated animals with flopped ears and um, shortened uh, muzzles or snouts. And then, of course, the increase in uh, white patterning on the coats. And so there is a hypothesis out there uh, which sort of ties that all together and tries to explain um, through uh, a developmental explanation, how those are all related and how there could be some sort of set of genes that affect, uh, you know, the body shape and the coat color and the behavior all at once. Um, but I think, so I just wanted to bring that up because I know that there's going to be people out there on Twitter saying, like, what about this? And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's absolutely a really, really interesting hypothesis that no one has actually found those genes for. Yeah. So we just don't know if it's, if it's a so, thing or not, but yeah. it's a really interesting idea. Unless Claire has found them. <laughs> <laughs> I think I do have some insight into that, but it's not, it's not for distribution yet. Well, then, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Coming soon. So, 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 so say something, since you got my hopes up because you grabbed the mic. It doesn't have to be the secret, just say something. Well, I, I think that there is a, that there is a broad-scale effect of a particular small group of genes that impacts many aspects of the animal's um, biology and that those changes, those genes do occur near these genes that also create these changes that you're talking about. Coming soon to a peer review yeah. journal near you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Um, some things that just came up a little bit were, obviously we're talking about breeding. Breed, bring, breeding is happening. Um, and also breeding culture. And so the idea that possibly in different parts of the world or in different communities or in different um, aims for breeding, there seems to be a different culture attached to it. So I guess what I was wondering is, um, for, for viewers at home who just want a dog, who they love this... Um, type of dog, like how can they take any of these things into consideration, um, if that makes sense? How do they think about the, the human culture aspects of some people are thinking about behavior and, um, uh, and physical appearance as, you know, how do, how, do we, how do we help people at home? I think it's really key that, I think it's really key that the, that the person um, if they're getting the dog from a breeder, they need to actually talk very carefully with that person and establish what their philosophy is on breeding and to ensure that they have the same goals and desires that the person does who's trying to choose that animal. If they're getting an animal from a shelter, I have less expertise in, in guiding people in that respect, but one would ho hope that the shelter staff will have done some behavioural um, assessment of those animals and could possibly guide someone to choose the animal that best suits them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, and I think to follow up on what Claire said, if you're picking a dog from a breeder, it's also really important rather than just saying, oh, I want this particular breed because there is so much variation within the breed. You really need to look at the immediate relatives of that dog to make an informed decision about what you might get in your home. Maybe just adding one that now there, there, is, there are a lot of genetic tests or screens that you can do and specific breeds um, actually could be tested now. So one way to check whether the breeder is really conscious about all these problems, I mean, it's just good to ask whether those dogs are, or the parents of the dogs mm -hmm. were checked for that specific gene. Uh, and then if you get a negative answer, you <laughs> might not want to get the dog from the breeder. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and, and not just genetic tests, the two veterinarians here are thinking like, oh, well, it's also good to do, you know, that the parents have been checked for uh, hip health yeah. and, and that sort of thing, depending yeah. on what the yeah. various issues are in that breed, eye health, things like yeah. that. So, We've had a question that kind of leads on from that that's come through via Twitter from Scott. And Scott's asking, have we begun to catalog, catalog genetic traits um, in comparison to the source wild genome? So uh, have we looked at um, whether they're mutations or come from... Um, comparative free-ranging dog populations. Has any of that sort of work been done? Where, where the genes are coming from? They are yeah, coming, or they're coming from the wolf. Cataloging <laughs> 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 genetic traits and whether no. they're specific yeah. to domesticated dog breeds black or coat whether they're being mutations. Yeah. Mm. Black coat color came back, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this as if yeah. you don't know, I know that you mm. do know, but black coat color yeah. came back into the dog, uh, into the wolf from the dog. So there have been at least some cases of new mutations occurring in dogs. Um, although absolutely, we do think that most of uh, most of the variation that we see in dogs seems to actually be in wolves as well. It just seems to be that we have managed to concentrate it into dogs. But there have been some cases of of new mutations that people thought were really cool and then selected for. And in terms of a catalog, not really. No catalog. No, no, no well, file. Well, but there is a catalog of. G oh, okay. <coughs> I just want to say that there's a catalog of, of genes that might affect really how. So, so you can really go on and each day you get uh, pot genes that have the potential to aff that affect the dog has. What is not really known because we don't, I mean, there was not really a search in the wolf genome for that variants, whether they are really mutations or where they come from the, the wolf population. The problem is that the, the wolf population that is alive at the time when you are taking the genes are already those who were selected out. Mm -hmm. So maybe the genes are still there, but the only those those carriers are dying as a puppy or never actually grow up, but we don't know that. Right. Yeah, yeah. If people are interested to learn more about what genetic variants are catalogued and known for any domestic animals, I would just give a plug to uh, a resource that has been developed by Professor Frank Nicholas at the University of Sydney called Online Mendelian Inheritance in Animals, OMIA. And at that site you can search on the species and you can search on the particular characteristic that interests you and it will lead you to the literature that supports that, that change in those animals. We'll oh, also right, tweet right. that out. Thank you. Um, so kind of uh, bringing it a little bit back to the dog-human relationship, um, is there, do you think we'll ever be able to identify behavioral types, behavioral syndromes, personalities, however you want to describe it, um, that correlate with <coughs> genotypes um, and that are able to help us match dogs and people um, based on their compatibility? Um, divorce came to mind, so I'm not sure about that in humans, but... Okay. You know, I think what I would like to say is that um, it's not black and white. And the way I think about phenotypes is it's a distribution. And so for a given genotype, let's say we're talking about the dopamine DRD4 receptor, you're going to get a range, a spectrum of behaviors or positions along that axis. And depending on training and environment and other things, you might be able to shift things left and right. But I think there's still a lot of latitude, even with certain genotypes, for um, variability in behavior, without a doubt. Yeah, and I think it's it's certainly important to recognize the importance of environment, as we've been talking about all day, in developing anybody's personality. Um, some of the work that we're doing in Carlson Lab, where I work at the Bird Institute right now, is uh, this working dog project where we're trying to find uh, pretty much exactly that, some kind of, uh, of genetic markers that would help us 
uh, provide information to groups that are breeding working dogs. Right now we're mostly working with guide dog and assistance dog groups to help them do better at selecting or sort of move faster, I should say, because they're doing a fabulous job already, uh, but move their selection faster in a particular direction and, and be able to uh, have that extra information about what the genes say. Um, and the, the thing about that kind of selection is that you really sort of can get the information that you need if you wait for the dog to grow up and, and, and mate it and see what its offspring look yeah, like. And you get that information. Yeah, there's something called breeding values mm -hmm. that yes. get used, is that right? That's yeah. what they're using right now. And so what happens is they have to, in order to really know the genetic potential of a particular dog, they have to look at all of its relatives, including its offspring, which means that you have to have some litters mm -hmm. and sort of you know see how it goes. And the mm -hmm. hope is that with um, the genomic addition on top of that, which are genomic estimated breeding values, which is what I was talking about as being used in cattle right now. Mm -hmm. The hope is that you would have that some of that information uh, for at least what the, the genes of the dog is going to pass on uh, before he grows up and, and has mm -hmm. those first litters, which would help them move faster in one direction. Whether that means that they would move in the wrong direction faster or the right direction faster, we don't know yet. You can find out quicker, though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to add to that at all, Karen? No. no. Okay. There's another question that has just come through from Alex, who's asking, um, has there been any research examining how diet impacts learning in dogs? Just with the um, raw feeding seeming to become more popular, wondering if there's been anything in, like even just in terms of pointing cue or gaze responses? I'm curious about how diets might impact genes and learning. Yeah, so there's um, there actually the the big uh, dog nutrition companies have done research on this, and um, so there are commercial foods out there that are advertised as uh, improving your your dog's intellect. Um, and I, I my understanding is that those are mostly based on um, things like essential fatty acids, mm -hmm. and so which by the way don't um, don't carry well in kibble, and so I supplement those for my dogs. Um, so there, there is information about that, and reading up on uh, fatty acids is a great first step. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. I, I had a chance to see, um, to see a presentation by Hills Pet Nutrition where they did uh, maze running, I think it was with beagles at different ages, and they showed that using a diet that they formulated that was uh, enriched in omega fatty acids, they got the time to complete the maze down, like a statistically mm -hmm. significant difference. And, it was a clinical study. I think that if you could find the paper, if you search PubMed, I don't know, maybe just search for um, some of the terms that you had in your question and then like omega fatty acid and things like that. But we can share it. Oh, please. Um, as always, before making changes to your dog's diet, consult with your veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you don't want your dog to be faster and quicker and smarter. <laughs> yes. Oh, I think. Uh, oh, I was just going to add that. Um, uh, this isn't so much in terms of behavioral development, but speaking about diet and behavior, there are also some diets, um, specifically ones that have medium chain triglycerides that are used for treating conditions like epilepsy in dogs or cognitive dysfunction in dogs. And there is um, there are some nice clinical trials that show improvement in cognitive functioning in older dogs that are fed on those diets. So that's an important thing to consider as well. Mm -hmm. Hold on. No. Um, and actually, towards the end of your talk, you brought up another area with oxytocin, and some people might at home, things that we give our dogs, um, some people's, some light bulbs went off and they said, ah, oxytocin nasal spray, um, because that's kind of a little bit of a buzz, so I'm hoping you all can just chat a little bit about it, tell people what that is. Well, the first thing I would say... What is oxytocin? Oxytocin is a hormone, but the first thing I would say is that homeostasis is very important in a biological system, and if you give an exogenous or external source of something, usually the body down-regulates the endogenous or internal source. So if you start giving external sources of oxytocin, you might reduce the amount of oxytocin that your dog has, and then any of the benefits that are produced by oxytocin may be lost even in, even in the normal stents. You may get lower than you want in the long term, so I would, I would advise not to do that. But I'm not a doctor, so <laughs> consult your veterinarian. You are, you are a doctor. You are. Not but, a yeah, well, I mean, and there have been similar studies in humans looking at the effects of oxytocin nasal spray in autistic children, and um, and the very strong recommendation from the med the human medical community is please do not go and um, try doing this on your child because we just we don't know what it does. 
Um, I think I should, maybe uh, me and Julie and I could put our heads together and find some good links to the vol studies mm -hmm. that you guys could tweet out afterwards. So the really classic oxytocin studies, which are just fascinating reading, and I'm pretty sure there's some accessible stuff out there for people to read, are uh, the studies that were done some number of years ago on voles, um, looking at these two different species of voles, one of which um, are monogamous and one of which is not monogamous and, and otherwise very, very similar species. And the researchers found that the differences had to do with the receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin, which is a closely related hormone, in particular regions of the brain. And they actually were able, by um, genetically modifying one of the species so that it expressed more of the receptors in that particular uh, region of the brain, to make that species suddenly start behaving um, monogamously similar to the other species. So some, some really, really fascinating stuff. But, and the, the take home message from that, I think, for us, is that at least in those voles, it didn't matter how much oxytocin we put into their systems. What mattered was where the receptors were in their brain, which is something that we are not currently easily able to change. I mean, they're able to do it in those voles, but we are nowhere near, um, actually, I shouldn't say that, right? We're getting closer and closer to be able to do some of those things in individuals, but we're really not there yet. And I think so. one of the things with oxytocin, it's a relatively you know, new area where there's emerging research happening in the field of dogs at the moment, but and it seems quite similar as well in some regards to the way we have looked at using uh, an indicator like cortisol in that we would really like it to be a much simpler story than it's turning out that it's being. So, for example, you know, cortisol, we would like that to be a stress marker in dogs. It's not. It's a bit more complicated than that. And it isn't as simple as being a pH test for stress. Um, similarly, oxytocin doesn't seem to be, you know, an attachment pH test or, um, you know, we can't add more and just get more love. So... The simplistic way that we tend to first understand these hormones isn't necessarily the full story and we're still picking that apart. So I guess perhaps we can maybe talk a little bit about just the complexity of how do we pick it apart. Um, how, and what I guess also is an inhibitor to our understanding more. So, you know, is it just we haven't had enough funding coming in to be able to research that in depth? Is it that it's complicated? We need to look at large groups of dogs that we don't get access to as researchers? Can we maybe look at that sort of big picture stuff? The funding in general, you mean? Or, or well, yeah, we well I mean, if you talk, I, I probably many people are not interesting, interested in the funding, but actually getting funding for dog research is generally but very I difficult. People might be surprised to realize that it is hard to get funding yeah. to look at questions. It, in it's dogs. very difficult because yeah. actually, obviously most of the funding goes for, for, for human research. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's obvious, either medical or, or any other human research. So, so most of when we had this discussion amongst us, I mean, we found out that our dog research is actually supported by some other sources, which maybe we should also say it so openly, but that sometimes happened in the last this, this uh, cross hub. So it's difficult to get, and, and obviously, uh, just to go back to oxytocin, I think the, the best uh, maybe way to, uh, simplest way to discourage people to doing it is that dons, don, dogs hate to be sprayed in the nose. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think you will realize it soon. So your dog wouldn't like it to do it. So and so and uh, the, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think even for researchers, it's actually quite difficult to, to solve that. And we are not sure whether the change uh, hap that happens in the in the behavior later might be just caused by this uncomfortable uh, um, interaction with the, with the spray. But obviously, you can do specific controls and find out. So, so I mean, people, yes, there are these uh, resu research out there, and there are some positive results with regard to the oxytocin, so that uh, has a short-term effect, at least on the behavior. But I think, for the moment, I totally agree with the others. They should not really take it as a, as a wonderful solution for all the problems that they, have, they might have with their dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think just to add to something that Adam said about, you know, with the human research, and there's a lot of promise there in terms of oxytocin, that also highlights the complexity because I believe that there's some research in humans that shows that when humans are treated with oxytocin, they might be pro, more pro-social with familiar people, mm -hmm. but actually be more anti-social mm -hmm. with unfamiliar people. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a challenging area. So now all the viewers at, at home have to decide who had the oxytocin nasal spray on this panel? <laughs> okay. There were three people that did. <laughs> um, I, I did want to say something, though, about the difficulty of getting um, research funding for dogs, uh, because I am at a, a lab right now that is focusing on dogs, and we are 
um, actively working on getting research money. And the really good news about it is that dogs are really, turn out to be fabulous models for humans. Um, in a lot of ways, much better than studying the laboratory rodents that we've traditionally used. Um, they're in our environment. They get a lot of the same diseases that we do. Um, they have a lot of the same behavioral problems that we do. They get a lot of the same cancers that we do. Um, and so they can just be really great models, particularly because their, um, their lifespan, um, I think, unfortunately, is so much shorter than a human's lifespan. So it's much easier to follow a dog through its entire life and see um, prospectively what's going on early on and then whether it develops a disease or a behavioral disorder. Later, much more difficult to follow a human through 80 years of life. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is that dogs have these nice, very carefully defined populations that, these, that purebred dogs have uh, sort of much um, more homogeneous genetics and that that's harder to find in populations of humans these days unless you go to very um, sort of segregated populations of humans. Um, so for all those reasons, I think dogs make a fantastic model. And so I think more and more labs will start doing what our lab is doing, which is saying we're studying dogs, but they're useful for humans. Could I just ask you to clarify for our viewers, you know, like in the 60s and the 70s, the idea that your pet would be kidnapped and used for research was horrific. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what dog <laughs> research means in yes. your lab? Yes. <laughs> yes, no, yes. Um, I, I had a moment where I was thinking I was going to make a hilarious joke about how we kidnap dogs off the street, and then I remembered that you, there's this whole audience who doesn't know my particular somewhat warped sense of humor. Um, <laughs> so the, the way that we do dog research is by having uh, people who own dogs in their homes, pet dogs, um, uh, sign up and give us information about their dogs and send us their dog's DNA. And then, of course, Adam does the lovely studies where they work with people uh, with pet dogs who I believe probably come to physically come to you and do the studies there. Um, but these are but these are pet dogs there, right? <laughs> As opposed to us, we just have people on the internet talking yeah. to us. Um, but yeah, absolutely, these are pet dogs. So and that's for... one of the beauties of, I guess, with researching dogs, isn't it? That we can have people send us videos from their homes, mm -hmm. as Julie did when she was looking at play. Mm -hmm. um, we can have them come in and run through a uh, um, series of behavioral tests that we asked them, which uh, something our lab did, looking at whether dogs could identify their owners in a mirror reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can also have things where you're just collecting a physical sample like some saliva mm -hmm. to extract DNA information. So it's part of the beauty of the diversity of the ways we can work with dogs to learn more about them. Yes, there are nearly no research laboratories that actually house dogs mm -hmm. these days. There are some, mm -hmm. not very many. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add to the difficulty of doing this kind of research. A lot of the research that's done in other species like domestic um, production animal species like cattle and sheep, they have very, very large numbers of animals that are housed in similar conditions. And typically, I, I, I always say that doing dog research is like working with village goats in Asia or something where you have small holders who have one or two animals. You're not dealing with people who have, you know, 500 animals that are treated the same way absolutely every day. And so this is a limitation to the research we do and in terms of the estimated breeding values that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. But I think that by working together, there's a lot of potential and as more data becomes available in the public domain that um, things will become easier for us. But there is a big problem with accessing research funding. Mm, there is also, I guess, the power through collaboration around the world, things like looking at cortisol, um, as an example, because it's one that I was involved with myself with my research, but we were able to do a meta-analysis where we pulled in raw data from studies that have been done all around the world. And through that, including some of Jessica's data, that's right, <laughs> through that we were able to then answer some of those questions about what are the impact, you know, relating to environment factor. You know, we were able to show there's a significant difference in cortisol if the owner's present when the sample's taken versus if they're not, um, depending on the sex of the dog, depending on if the dog's been in a displaced environment for more than three weeks, like a shelter. So that does allow us through the power of collaborating and sharing data with each other to perhaps get at some of the bigger picture questions and pull it apart with more power than we can on our own. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so who had the oxytocin? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was easy. <laughs> uh, can we ask our viewers to vote on who they think had the oxytocin and who did not? Uh, we'll, we'll give you the results in five minutes. That's correct, that's correct. When, the, when this ends. Excellent. Um, so one of the other questions that uh, Katerina had on Twitter was, what is your take on motor pattern differences between breeds? Mm -hmm. yes. 
what is the, it was specifically pitched at Adam, so yeah, what is your take or, you know, what is your understanding of motor pattern differences between breeds? Well, I mean, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, well, I mean, um, so I think people should be conscious about that, that, that there are breeds that are have not the same ability as others, for example, to signal agonistic tendencies, which I think is important. So, so for example, if you are, if a pug and a German Shepherd is confronting each other, just, you know, even a very happy way, even they want to play, this is quite difficult to negotiate in comparison when two German Shepherds want to play each other. So I think this is what people have to understand and, and even, and also to understand in some other situations that, that maybe some dogs don't like to be with other dogs because of these uh, problems of interpretation. So I think, and that's not because of the dog, I mean, itself doesn't like it, but it mm -hmm. has problems of expressing mm -hmm. himself, and therefore they have bad experience, and then this is uh, continuing in this way. So I think this is the whole thing. Otherwise, uh, I think it's I very exciting for the ethologist, and also probably from a genetic perspective, is that probably there are some genes behind these differences. And, and if you want to understand how behavior is organized, it was many times mentioned, this nice structure that you have these breeds in this specific environment and selected in a specific way and having a specific genetic structure. I mean, it would be a very nice model to look for the inheritance of these uh, these element, genetic elements. And I think that has been done many, many years ago, uh, but then there was no the genomics there. So today, maybe, uh, especially with the designer dogs, it might be a possibility to look, look in this direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was just going to say, one of the interesting things about the designer dog studies is that um, you can start to piece together with some uh, nice genetic, like some nice uh, studies, what regions of the genome in certain breeds may be responsible for certain traits. Because you know, in each breeding, you might pass on only fifty percent of the genome, so traits that re re remain to multiple generations of, of F1, F2, F3 designer dogs might be really useful in kind of identifying some new markers yeah. that we haven't identified yet. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> <doing that>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that the oxytocin speaking? <laughs> Don't give it away. <laughs> uh, I guess it leans a little bit on from that too. Isabella, who was on Instagram, was wondering, can the reduced sense of smell in brachycephalic dogs have influenced the results of the study that looked at the differences between brachy and doliocephalic breeds? Uh, well... Probably yes and no. So I mean, in that experiment, it, there's no need to smell. And we know in, in when dogs are interacting with the humans, the, the smelling is the least uh, uh, information they are really relying on, especially if they are in the distance. Mm -hmm. So I think in that experiment, whether a dog could smell or, or didn't smell, that wa wasn't able to smell, had made no difference. Uh, but in other situations, maybe, because obviously, if you have a reduced skill of smelling uh, as a breed or as an individual, probably you are, have to rely more on the other senses. So maybe those dogs even have a better hearing in that sense, or they're more attentive to, to, to sounds because they, can't, they don't have this information from the smell. So this is actually very interesting, and we don't be, be really missing these studies. But we know, by the way, from another study, it came to my mind that, yes, brachiocephalic dogs have a less uh, uh, not so well developed smelling ability. So mm -hmm. we have shown that in, in uh, one study at least. Uh, but this is only for very small amount of uh, odors, so where they really differ from the other dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just, yeah. well, I have a question. So, I mean, <coughs> um, I think uh, pheromones are acting on the vomeral nasal organ, which is like a little separate than like the olfactory receptor system. But I was wondering if um, you could elaborate a little bit on uh, what you were talking about and get into. Do you think that the certain that the um, specific olfactory receptors have like an anterior posterior expression pattern, and that the loss of a length of the mm -hmm. the skull just like ablates part of the region where a specific olfactory receptor would be expressed? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, I mean, just when we are talking about smelling or any other ability, there are so many factors that can influence it. So the length of the nose, which basically de determines also the the surface of the olfactor of the olfactory epithelium, so basically where those receptors are, that is also a big, differ big difference. Then the whole system of your nasal system, so how long the air stays in the nose, mm -hmm. that is also a factor that we know. And for shorter nose dogs, I would assume that that's not the case. And obviously then there is the receptors 
we don't know whether there's a study actually comparing um, the the genes that are responsible for the, the these uh, these proteins. Whether there's a, I mean, we know that a lot of genes in dogs even compared to humans. But where, what is the the breed the very the difference between different breeds? I don't really know. But there's a study maybe you know that. But that could also have an effect on on the ability to to smell. I, I was aware of a study in German shepherds that there was a particular. Um, G protein coupled receptor olfactory variant that was associated with ability to so smell some solvents that some could and could not, but that was an intrabreed study, not an interbreed study. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're just getting near to the end of our panel session time frame for today. And so it does seem like olfaction <coughs> is, a smell is a great place to conclude because we're talking about dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, with that in mind, uh, we want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Our first speaker tomorrow will be Dr. Claire Wade. And so we look forward to seeing her tomorrow. And you'll also see a lot of these faces tomorrow on the panel um, as well. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you think of some more questions you'd like us to bring to the table tomorrow, don't forget to send them through on Twitter using the hashtag Sparks18. That's S-P-A-R-C-S-1-8. Any responses on who's had the oxytocin? We'll tune you in tomorrow okay. on that <laughs> joke. See you it's tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.